Okay, welcome back everyone. So now we're going to have a look at how we can manage our makeup. So we had a lot of control in the makeup last time and that's keeping our distance, stopping that critical distance from happening, stopping that change from top down to bottom up as far as our brain processing goes. So these are some things that we can actually help to manage our makeup. So we want to have a look back at arousal and stress. We want to have a look at timing, we want to have a look at emotions and threat. So what we want to have a look at is what we will need. So we're going to need a very keen eye. We're going to have a knowledge of body language. We need to know the animal in front of us. We need to understand its likes. We need to understand its dislikes. What gets excited, what makes it scared, what makes it vulnerable, what makes it go over the top. Are there any situations that it can train really well in and the situations where it can't train well in? And make sure that we're utilizing this for the animal's benefit. So we can understand what's going on in their brain. So the majority of dog training is based on operant conditioning. We control the consequences of the dog's behavior to increase or decrease those behaviors. You know, we will reward them for doing things, we'll punish them for not doing things. And punishments, I mean by taking things away. I'm not an advocate of punish positive punishment in any means. I don't like to add bad stuff to the situation when I'm training. There's just no need. And when you're dealing with emotions, it's counterproductive because you know we're just going to increase that fear and arousal which inhibits learning as we already know so to me there's just there's no scientific point to it let alone ethical you know i i can't do that to my dogs that's just the person that i am but i will take away treats i will give them little bits of time out i'm more likely to time myself out to be honest because my dogs enjoy spending time with me so if i say if you do that i'm leaving the room they're more inclined to listen to me that's how a lot of our training goes and it's very operant based our dogs have to be cognitively online so we're dealing a lot of the time with the dog to spot part of our brain our maker isn't really involved a lot in training or at least he shouldn't be so when we're working with these healthy brains this is what we expect from our training you know if they're getting overwhelmed in a situation they're getting difficult it's usually easier to get them back online and we can guide them we can teach them alternative behaviors we can do the differential reinforcement type stuff so trainers will know what i mean owners it's basically teaching them something else so don't jump up sit down or don't bark at the dog sit down and focus on me it's those sorts of things but when we've got our meerkat involved our dog isn't able to consciously control their actions in the same way so if you're finding that these training techniques aren't working because your dog's behavior isn't being motiva motivated by the consequences of their actions it's being motivated by their emotions it's an emotionally driven behavior, not an operantly driven behavior. I hope that makes sense for you. So we need to be aware of our timing. Our emotional systems retain the capacity to shut down our cortical activity during strong emotional experiences. And this can reduce memory retrieval and can even cause amnesia. So when we're working with these dogs in these fight and flight responses, we have to be very aware that they're not gonna remember a lot of stuff that we're training if they're emotionally driven. Um, you know, if we've got a delayed input from Dr. Spock and that neocortex, it's going to have an app response. In it. It's going to have an effect on our dogs. You know, we don't want them to be engaging in this fight or flight response when we're training them. You know, we don't want to be training them in a situation that triggers this emotional response from them because they just can't learn. The arousal is too, too high. The fight and flight is too active. Those arousal levels are through the roof. You know, we have got so much physiologically against us if we are trying to train our animals in these situations that we're just fighting a losing battle that is so disheartening for us, not to mention distressing for us and the dog. So basically, we want to make sure that we avoid these situations. We don't want our animal to be in these fight and fright situations. Um, you know, how they react is going to depend on the distance and their trauma history. So distance, again, is critical. Avoid those critical distances because not everything can be solved through training alone. A lot of these behaviors are their emotional responses, their reflex behaviors, they're driven by emotions, they're not driven by the consequences. So we need to be very, very aware of this. So I want to have a look at that timing. You know, when danger is past, we can recover past, but if our recovery is blocked, if we feel like we have to defend ourselves, if we can't escape from that situation, then we get dogs that are more irritable. So we find that when the trigger stacking on a walk, you know, they're on a walk, they're reacting at the first dog, 
there's another dog they're reacting at the next dog and it just keeps getting worse and worse because they're getting trigger stat they're getting more emotional response to it and they can't escape it so they know their recovery is blocked they're not going to have the time to calm down and to rest before seeing the next threat and our dogs are constantly triggered when they're on a walk and that's why you need to have a real think about does our dog really need that walk if this is an animal that is stressed and in a state of distress, whenever it goes on a walk because it's constantly being triggered into its fight and flight, is taking it for a walk really for its welfare or is it something that we've just got into our heads is what our dogs need? There are other things that we can do. Our dogs still need stimulation, they still need exercise, but they don't necessarily need a walk or they don't need that particular walk in that location. Give it a couple of days and go to a different location. Maybe drive somewhere and take them out of town. We need to be very aware and mindful of if our dogs need the walks that we're actually giving them. So how can we help these dogs? Well, we can do if in doubt chill out protocols where we teach our dogs to relax. We teach them to settle in very safe environments and we build this up into other environments in very gradual situations. The rehabilitation courses that I do kind of go into this in more detail where it's lots of incremental. So if the dog isn't sure what to do, they just chill out They're like, oh, OK, well, I'll just chill out here. And it's that being able to relax in different situations, in the presence of other distractions and new things before you go anywhere near the things they are threatened by, if you ever get to the things they're threatened for. The ability to relax is so important. As we saw from the default mode network, a lot of these animals aren't able to relax of their own accord. We need to increase that predictability. We want to get some routines in place. We want to make sure that they have expectations that can be met. And if they can't be met, they're able to do something else about it that they can control some bits of things should you medicate your dogs sometimes yes sometimes no this is something that you discuss with your vet and is very much a case-by-case -case basis medication can absolutely help especially if you've got animals that are anxious and they're wound up and their meerkat is just taking over all the time and they're not able to get that baseline down then yeah these medications can help because they physiologically help to alter us otherwise we're fighting a losing battle but medication is something that you must discuss with your vet and a veterinary behaviorist, ideally. Someone that understands the psychopharmacology as part of things and how to use these medications alongside the behavior modification plans. Because if you don't use the right medications, you can do more harm than good. Please don't discuss medications amongst yourselves. Talk to qualified professionals about it. And then we want to look at safety. So if we go right back to the very first lesson, safety is along the is on one of those bottom two rungs of that pyramid that we saw we need our animals to feel safe we need them to feel safe in their environment and we need them to feel safe with us if they're safe with us they can trust us if they know you're not going to put them in a situation that they can't actually cope with it's going to really help our animals because they'll start to go actually mom's listening to us now or dad's starting to be aware that when i'm struggling he takes me out of the situation before i can't control myself anymore you know, so we're helping them to manage their makeup. So really just be aware of our dogs and just help them control and get through this because they, it is so worth it when you help them. But at the minute, you know, they really struggle and we need to keep that clear. We can't control that makeup completely. We can teach them to manage it. We can stop it from taking over. So now we know how to manage the makeup. Let's have a look at the next lesson of how we can control that makeup.